horror movies. Please, he's gonna try and kill me. Watching them is one thing, surviving them is another. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. You can never have sex. You can never drink or do drugs. Never, ever, ever say I'll be right back. Then along came a film that surprised Hollywood, critics, and audiences by daring to defy them all. There's a formula to it, a very simple formula. We took every single rule and broke it. And introduced moviegoers to a new kind of horror movie. You're starting to sound like some Wes Carpenter flick or something. I think what makes the Scream films original is the fact that they take a look at themselves and they take a look at the horror genre itself. And I think that was a very new concept. It was very, very acutely aware of the genre and kind of slyly announcing to the audience of, we know what you're thinking and you better hang on to your seats because we're going to do something different. It was a film that leaned on humor, but still managed to scare the hell out of audience. We're going to go over boundaries that you didn't think we'd go over and not just in gore. It's not just a scary guy with a knife. It's, it's not knowing who that person is. No one had seen anything like that. This scary movie also attracted a hot young cast of up-and-comers. Everybody wanted to be in this movie. The fact that all these actors were just people I all I respected. And on December 20th, 1996, an unsuspecting holiday audience was taken by the throat. I didn't realize how scary the movie was going to be. Oh, I think this is probably going to work better than we expected. But with a screenplay in what was a dying genre... It was the worst timing in the world. Horror was done. A brand name director who kept saying no. I think the reason that I passed on it was my usual stupidity. And a bitter controversy over a key filming location which divided an entire town. The local papers were actually attacking the production. Bringing this scary movie to the screen would come with its own set of challenges. I was so desperate when I wrote it. I couldn't pay my bills, and my car payment was due, and my and I was three months behind on my rent. West was really under the gun from the studio because they didn't see it. And in Hollywood parlance, that means you're about to be fired. You know, early on, we got an NC-17 rating. Is this going to be the nail in some people's careers, you know, in their career coffin? No, do it! This is the story of an unproven screenwriter, a director in need of a hit, and a maverick studio that reinvented the rules of horror and made scary movies fun again. This is Inside Story, Scream. By the mid-1990s, the infamous Unabomber was finally captured. Moviegoers flocked to Independence Day. Television's hottest shows were ER and Seinfeld. Everyone was doing the Macarena, and kids everywhere were playing with Tickle Me Elmo. But on December 20th, 1996, the horror movie Scream was released to film audiences ready for a new kind of terror. The Scream movie is something totally different. It was a movie that, that hit at the right time culturally, um, it recognized uh, it, the, you know, the pop icons of, of the past and then brought them into the fold in a way that was so uniquely entertaining. Those past genre icons, films such as Black Christmas, When a Stranger Calls, Halloween, Friday the 13th, and A Nightmare on Elm Street were the spiritual fathers of Scream, a movie that would pay homage to them as much as it would break new ground. It's about a group of teenagers being terrorized and murdered. <laughs> but what made it unique was that it was a satire on those films. This scary movie tells the story of a seemingly typical teenage girl coming of age. She's surrounded by a close group of friends. She has a boyfriend with raging hormones. Okay, okay, time's over, stud bucket. A father whose life is one business trip after another. Have a good trip, okay? But Sydney Prescott's life is anything but ordinary as she tries to come to terms with the brutal murder of her mother one year ago. Only a year ago, Maureen Prescott, wife and mother, was found raped and murdered not far from this peaceful town square. And just when things seem to be getting back to normal, the quiet town of Woodsboro is once again plagued by a killer. 
someone targeting Sydney, someone who is taking their love of scary movies one step too far. It's totally different, you know what I mean? And it's like, who knows what can happen? But there was more to this slasher movie than its cast being stalked by yet another masked murderer. I would describe Scream to a friend as a high school romp gone very, very wrong. Scream was so brilliant and so smart and funny, but it took the deaths and the scares very seriously. You have this group of kids talking about the killings and the quiet one, you know, Nev Campbell's character, Sidney Prescott, you don't know much about her at all. And then you see that she's tied into it all because there was a murder of her mother earlier on. And this guy, Cotton Weary, is accused of it. You know, if I was wrong about Cotton Weary, then the killer's still out there. I think it would never been done before where there was a plot that was very intricate, very entangled with, uh, you know, hidden secrets. One of the most successful elements of the movie is the mystery element. And Scream taps into that. It taps into it beautifully. You were constantly guessing about who the killer could be. It could have been anyone. The killer's still on the loose, isn't he? Come on, Sid. Those murders are related. I think um, Sydney's past is coming back to haunt her, obviously because of uh, the murder of her mother and having to deal with that and, and having to overcome that. That kept it very grounded in something we all can really attach our emotions to. I feel like she's lived, she's been hurt, she's seen life. Your mother's murder was last year's hottest court case. Somebody was gonna write a book about it. Right, and it had to be you with all your lies and theories. With a new, hip, and more modern sensibility, Scream set itself apart from slasher movies of the past. It was finally the movie where the characters had seen other movies. Terror Train, Prom Night. How come Jamie Lee Curtis is in all of these movies? I mean, it was basically saying, hey, you know what? We've seen all these movies. We know what's up. And we're going to spell it out. We're going to say what everyone's been thinking. And now, from this point forward, this is how horror movies are going to work. Oh, you want to play psycho killer? Can I be the helpless victim? Like many horror movies, Scream would open on a dark night with a young girl alone in her isolated house. But her solitude would quickly be shattered by a mysterious phone call. Hello? Hello. Yes? Who is this? Mm, who are you trying to reach? That quickly turned into a terrifying game. Listen to me. You hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? People thought, well, Drew Barrymore is going to be in the whole film. The fact that it's Drew Barrymore and she dies, it just tells you your preconceptions about this kind of movie are wrong. But there would be other potential victims, starting with Sydney's friends, who offered a unique but cynical view of teenage life in the 90s. Part of the brilliance of the script was the way the characters spoke to each other. There is kind of a, a numbness to to violence that obviously we're more excited by what's going on than horrified by what's going on. What? No way. And we're not just talking killed, we're talking splattered movie killed, ripped open from end to end. These kids were too, a little too smart for their own good and wanting to see how far they could push it and what they could get away with. The first among them is Sydney's boyfriend, Billy, who despite his surface charms, would be the first of the film's many suspects. Do you wish to give up the right to remain silent? I didn't do anything. He's charming and he's mysterious and he's, uh, there's just a lot to him. Billy is a really interesting character because there is something wrong with him. He's cool and he's good looking, so he gets a pass, which happens in real life. Couldn't have been me, I was in jail, remember? Sydney's best friend and constant companion, Tatum Riley. I made her really wide-eyed and and uh, just fun, not stupid, but just a kind of a great little effervescent being. Tatum's boyfriend and Billy's best friend, Stu Mocker. I had this, you know, this kind of crazy youth and this energy and was fearless and I just kind of was bouncing off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I look back at that performance, I'm like, what was he letting me do? It was ridiculous. And finally, Randy Meeks, the quintessential geek who couldn't get the girl, but knew more than a thing or two about the inner workings of a horror movie. If they watch Prom Night, they'd save time. Oh, okay, we know everything that's going to happen in horror movies. And so, you know, my character was the one that actually helped say that. It was like kind of the voice of the people. The Randy character is one of the most original characters in the script, the kid who knows the rules. 
It's a brilliant idea, and it's part of what made the movie so fresh, because Randy is a real kid. The film was more than young people in Jeopardy. It also featured a host of adult characters, starting with the boyish and bumbling deputy of Woodsboro, Dewey Riley. Does the force require you to work out? No, ma'am. Because of my boyish good looks, muscle mass has increased my acceptance as a Sears police officer. I had different, uh, you know, traits and characteristics that I thought I could bring, like, a real sweet element to Dewey, and he's a loving character. I, he's still a little kind of kid inside. It's very strange to see this sort of aw shucks guy in a world where, you know, all these kids are so smart and wily, and yet you've got this, this sort of, you know, Barney Fife wandering around, which is tremendously entertaining. Opposite Deputy Dewey was hyper-aggressive reporter Gail Weathers, who would stop at nothing to get what she wanted. Hi, Gail Weathers, reporting live from Woodward Police Station. Hey, we're going to you a glimpse of Sydney Prescott. Hey, watch her, Larry. Hey, watch the hand. Hey, no you know camera. what you're dealing with here? The character, Gail Weathers, is just a great, just a classic tabloid journalist. And no one felt Gail sting more than her cameraman and resident flunky, Kenny Jones. He was Gail's chief whipping boy, you know, that uh, rolls downhill, and she was at the apex of the hill, and he was at the bottom. And finally, keeping a watchful eye on his students was the morally upright but slightly unhinged Principal Hembry. You make me so sick. Your entire habit-inducing, thieving, whoring generation disgusts me. Yeah, Principal Hembry and Sheriff Burke are uh, the only real present adults. Uh, the mother is uh, dead, uh, and the father is going off on a business trip, and uh, there's really doesn't seem to be too many other parents around. I would imagine that the reason that her father is saying that he wants to leave town is to use uh, the character as a red herring. Have you located Sidney's father yet? No, not yet. Well, he's not a suspect, is he? We haven't ruled him out as a possibility. Even with its cast of colorful characters and would-be suspects, and its knack for turning every cliche on its head, the question remained, could the horror movie make a comeback? Well, the horror genre was not really in vogue at that moment. They were seen as funny, they weren't so scary anymore, um, so people weren't really making them. I mean, horror was dead. Dead or not, one devoted horror movie fan decided it was time to take a gamble and write something that would defy expectations and break new ground. I was trying to create something new and different that we haven't seen before. I wanted it to sort of just be perverse and very sort of um, satirical, but very real. The resulting screenplay, originally titled Scary Movie, was indeed satirical, but its inspiration came from an event that was grisly, shocking, and most disturbingly, true. and all, it's like right out of a horror movie or something. By the mid-1990s, audiences had grown tired of the played-out formula of typical teen horror movies, popularized by lackluster sequels and inferior imitators. When even previously unstoppable horror icons, such as Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Freddy Krueger failed to deliver even modest box office returns, it seemed as if a staple of cinema just might fade into obscurity. Horror movies are a very specific genre, and they tend to go in cycles of what's being done at any given time. Um, in the 80s, there was the slasher, and the slasher picture really became the kind of horror movie, starting with Halloween, and then you had your Friday the 13th, your Nightmare on Elm Street, um, and then House on Sorority Row, and all those kinds of movies. Those movies had kind of played themselves out. The lead characters, the killers, were kind of being seen as, uh, as a joke. They were seen as funny. They weren't so scary anymore. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little soul, too. <laughs> Maybe just that it was at a time when the horror genre was not doing very well. So people weren't really making them. No one was doing it. By the mid-90s, the horror genre was, was truly dead. It seemed as though the film industry and audiences were prepared to let the typical stock and slash horror film rest in peace. Against this backdrop, one devout fan of the genre, 25-year-old Kevin Williamson, was desperately seeking to gain a foothold in the film business. Kevin had been kind of in town working at 
you know, relatively minor writing jobs. This was sort of the beginning of his career. He wasn't, he hadn't written a lot of things before this. After struggling to find work as an actor in New York City, Kevin Williamson's first attempt at crafting a screenplay came after making the move to Hollywood in 1991, but it would take four long years before Williamson would get his first break as a writer. I read uh, Kevin's very first script, Killing Mrs. Tingle, which I just thought was remarkable. Great characters, amazing dialogue. He really had a gift. Although Killing Mrs. Tingle sold to independent production company Interscope Communications, it languished in development hell, leaving Williamson to wonder if the film would ever be produced. Because of this, he found himself struggling once again to find work in the highly competitive trenches of Hollywood. We were looking to find him a job off of the sale of Killing Mrs. Tingle, and the horror franchises that le had led up to that moment had all kind of petered out. They were all kind of fading away. So it wasn't exactly the sexiest thing to be out looking for a horror job. So in, that, in truth, we were having a hard time finding Kevin a great gig. To make ends meet, Kevin Williamson took a job house-sitting for a friend. It was this decision and his financially desperate situation that put him at the right place at the right time, allowing him to catch a news program about a very disturbing subject. He was house-sitting, and he was watching a TV special about real murders and uh, kind of started scaring himself as he was watching it. Williamson had a right to be scared as he sat alone in the quiet house, watching the very real story of an infamous Florida serial killer. A tale so terrifying and so unbelievable, it seemed like something right out of a scary movie. Between November 1989 and August 1990, Danny Rowling murdered five students in Gainesville, Florida. Local media dubbed him the Gainesville Ripper. Her body was also posed and her head was left on a shelf as though to shock whomever walked into the scene. Rowling would break into the apartments and dormitories of unsuspecting college students torturing, decapitating, sexually assaulting, and mutilating his victims, posing them grotesquely to highlight the chaos and carnage he had caused. The case had finally come together, and on November 15, 1991, Danny Rowling was indicted to stand trial as the Gainesville killer. The horrifying true story of the Gainesville Ripper was an eerie reminder to Williamson of his favorite fright film, Halloween, a bona fide genre classic. The tale of unstoppable killer Michael Myers had terrified Williamson as a 12-year-old child as much as it had inspired him. The great thing about Kevin is he'd seen every horror movie, and for him, Halloween was the seminal movie. You know, he loves Halloween, and he loves the genre, and he has that wicked sense of humor. He had called a friend, I guess, to kind of help him feel more relaxed. Instead, they ended up talking about scary movies and what's your favorite scary movie and all that. What's your favorite scary movie? I don't know. You have to have a favorite. What comes to mind? Um, Halloween. You know, the one with the guy in the white mask who walks around and stalks babysitters? And that was the genesis of what eventually became Scream. From that one frightening night, an idea for a new kind of horror movie was born, one that would rely on the conventions of the horror movies Williamson had loved as a boy. The story came to him quickly. And I went off um, to the desert for three days and locked myself in a room and I pounded it out. Literally went to Palm Springs and wrote the script for Scary Movie, which is remarkable. I thought someone else is going to come along and make a scary movie or make a teenage movie and I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to have missed my chance. And there was another, even more compelling reason for his urgency. I was so desperate when I wrote it. I couldn't pay my bills, and my car payment was due, and, my, and I was three months behind on my rent. And he just let himself go and write it the way he thought, and I think that's always the, uh, the key to a really great script. Williamson took a gamble by crafting a screenplay that blended the cliches of his favorite horror movies with his own brand of dark humor. But would Hollywood respond to a scary movie that dared to mix in a healthy dose of comedy with its terror? Do you like scary movies, Sydney? In 1994, Kevin Williamson, a struggling actor turned screenwriter, conceived of a brand new idea for a horror film that would turn every genre cliche on its head. But even lifelong horror fan Williamson wasn't sure what Hollywood's reaction would be to his unconventional script. He was so nervous when he gave it to us because he thought for sure we were just gonna, you know, think that it was a dreadful idea and uh, 
and that uh, it was the worst timing in the world. But Williamson's innovative concept paid off. The script he was hoping would turn his life around was an immediate hit with those who read it. When I read the script, I thought, uh, I thought it was brilliant. I think it was, you get a lot of scripts and, and they, they can take forever to read because they're dull or n not interesting, not original. And um, with Scream, it was a real page turner. And it was perfect. It was perfectly written. Right off the bat, it was really terrifying. It was so out of the blue, so unexpected to receive a script that good. Yeah, one of the things I loved about it when I first read it was it self-awareness. Sorry, that's the wrong answer. No, it's not. No, it's not. It was Jason. But at the same time, there was a real uh, humorous element. It didn't take itself too seriously. Then you should know Jason's mother, Mrs. Voorhees, was the original killer. Jason didn't show up until the sequel. I really wrote the script for the read because I wanted to sell it. I wanted people in Hollywood to go, oh, this is some cool dialogue. There's some cool characters. These are some cool plot twists. And it wasn't long before Hollywood responded. In terms of devising a strategy, we chose the smartest and best producers we could think of that could help to strengthen the project and in going into financiers. By the end of the day, there was four or five people bidding on it. Everyone else had called and said, we like it, we're gonna buy it, but we hadn't heard from Miramax yet. Williamson and his agents were hoping for a call from the boldest brothers of independent film, Bob and Harvey Weinstein, whose studio, Miramax Films, had already blazed a Hollywood trail with a string of Oscar-winning films, such as Pulp Fiction, The English Patient, and Sling Blade. As luck would have it, Bob Weinstein had recently begun a new upstart division that would focus solely on genre fare. He called his sister company, which had already acquired the rights to the Hellraiser and Halloween franchises, Dimension Films. I had told the people that were working for me the kind of movie that I was looking for, something that would be different than just the rest. And um, I had an assistant named Richard Potter. And I remember one day calling me up and says, I think I just read the script that you described. I called him and I said, Bob, I just read a script. If you don't want to make this movie, then I don't know what you're looking for. So he laughed and said, well, I guess I better read it then. And I read it and I loved it and I uh, bid uh, for it. But with other major suitors, such as Paramount, Universal, and Morgan Creek already circling the script, Dimension Films knew they had to get in the game fast. As the days went on, a bidding war drove the script's price higher and higher. And as the stakes rose, previously interested parties dropped out until only two players were left standing. The two produ production entities that emerged as the most competitive were Kerry Woods and Kathy Conrad on one side, and Dan Halstead and Oliver Stone on the other side. Surprisingly, the writer and director of high-profile films such as Platoon, Wall Street, and JFK had also decided he wanted to scoop up the hottest spec script in town. But it happened to be at a time when Williamson got the call he was waiting for. The next morning, it was like 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, we got a call from Miramax. Say, you know, it's saying, okay, Bob read it, he loved it, he wants to buy it, how much? How much would become an important question when it came time to decide which buyer would ultimately make Scary Movie. There is a bidding war uh, that when our offer comes in, it is not as high as some of the other offers. And the decision to accept one of those offers could only come from Kevin Williamson. Bob understood it. Bob loved the genre. I mean, Halloween was one of his favorite movies. It was one of my favorite movies. We bonded instantly. He's like the uh, Quentin Tarantino of like filmology when it comes to every reference and every character that ever was in a horror movie. By acquiring the hottest spec script in town, Dimension Films solidified their future as a major player in the world of genre movies. It also changed Kevin Williamson's life forever with an initial check for $400,000 and the start of a career which would make him the new voice of a generation. Kevin really, really had his finger on the pulse of the modern American teenager. I'm gonna swing by the video store. I was thinking Tom Cruise and all the right moves. You know, if you pause it just right, you can see his penis. A lot of what Tatum said specifically, she brought a lot of the modern pop culture thing into it. And then obviously the Jamie Kennedy character, the Matthew Lillard character, the whole, it's a very savvy, funny, witty kids. Kizu, kiss, kizu, is easy. Dialogue in, in the Scream script was amazing. I mean, you read it, it just felt real or beyond real. You know, it felt like these kids were so smart and the fact that that was written and the fact that they were aware of horror movies. What movie is this from? I spit on your garage. There's home watching television, the, uh, 
The Exorcist was on. What's that werewolf movie with E.T.'s mom in it? The Howling Horror Straight Ahead. Having officially made his entrance as a legitimate Hollywood player, everyone was buzzing about the hottest new screenwriter in town, a man who had found a niche that had been missing from the cinematic landscape for over a decade, a movie about teenagers and high school life that felt real, timely, and generation-specific. He took the John Hughes formula and the slasher formula and made it feel modern and contemporary. And the film itself definitely was sort of hip and, and um, focused towards a, a younger generation. Definitely felt like a John Hughes movie gone to hell. Those kids in the John Hughes movies felt like modern, contemporary kids. Nothing could shock me anymore. Last night at the dance, my little brother paid a buck to see her underwear. Oh, really, Alicia? As if. Come on, Sporto. Level with me. Do you slip her the hot beef injection? Breast. I want to see Jamie Lee's breast. When do yes. we see Jamie yes. Lee's breast? And I think perhaps uh, Scream became similar to one of those films. Kevin just has very literate characters who are talking about everything that's going on. And I think that's what made the script so appealing. She wants to kill herself, but she realizes that teen suicide is out this year. And homicide is a much healthier therapeutic expression. Where do you get this? Ricky oh, You are pathetic. Kevin is the only one who can do that dialogue, and you believe it. Kevin really, really thought through everything. He really understood the structure and mythology of slasher films and red herring movies and just applied the John Hughes modern teenager to it. With a fresh take on an old genre, Dimension Films was ready to find a director for their horror hybrid. However, it began to seem as if Scary Movie would never get made when nearly every bankable horror director in town said no. Kevin Williamson's scary movie was a script that took Hollywood by storm, putting the hot young writer on the fast track to success. But the production faced a major hurdle, finding a director who could successfully blend the satirical elements of the screenplay with spine-tingling horror. And the first person that came into our minds was Wes Craven. I mean, when you think about the first Nightmare on Elm Street, that's the only movie you watch, you see that this guy can scare you. way he's the best there is. So I figured if we're gonna make our first uh, Dimension movie, why not go with the best? He was not interested in doing this, which was a huge disappointment. I passed, and I passed for um, quite a while. I know they had approached George Romero and Sam Raimi, and you know, kind of like the staples of, of the horror world. There's always another list of directors, but you'd stare at that list and start crying. I feel like we were kind of dragging our feet to a certain extent because we really wanted to get Wes to do it. Wes wanted to do other things, and it, for, it, was, it was a conversation as to whether or not he would go back and do horror. I understand it. He didn't want to do, quote, another slasher movie. With the talent pool shrinking fast, the studio behind the project, Dimension Films, continued to hope that their director of choice would change his mind. Wes Craven has influenced horror in the 70s with Last House on the Left, in the 80s with Nightmare on Elm Street. You cannot overstate how incredibly influential Wes Craven has been to the horror genre and has continually made movies for different generations that felt so contemporary. Craven's previous work, at times critically lauded, often shocking, but always provocative, reached mainstream success with 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street. In it, he created one of the most iconic figures in all of modern horror, Freddy Krueger. Wes became horror meister Wes Craven, slasher director Wes Craven, and I became horror star, uh, slasher star Robert England. You know, then that and that gets attached to your name for a while. Before long, Craven found himself firmly enmeshed in the world of horror movies, a place where he could use his talent at evoking blood-chilling terror to maximum effect. I read an interview with Wes once somewhere where he said, within the realm of horror movies, you can do anything you want. You can explore any issue you want. You just have to have a jump out and grab you every 10 minutes. I think people would
would imagine because of the films that he makes that he uh, would be really twisted in some way. Of course, he is in some way. Um, but he's also uh, just a really lovely energy, really wonderful, really calm, um, a great director, a great leader, and people love to work with him. When you meet Wes, it's pretty, it's pretty shocking because you expect someone who's like a little creepier and he's so intelligent and soft-spoken and just kind because you're like, wow, you know, what's going on behind those sweet eyes that has such darkness and crazy? It was Craven's ability to take audiences to the dark side that kept him in the minds of Dimension executives, even though he had passed on the project more than once. I think the reason that I passed on it was my usual stupidity. You know, just, I, I have this long, long, career-long ambivalence towards doing genre films, and um, I don't want to sound like uh, I'm prissy, but there is an element to the genre that is, uh, can be said to be misogynistic, for instance, and always carving up girls. And there's a part of me that feels like, how much longer do you want to do this? The answer came after a certain young movie star showed interest in the project, a move which enticed Craven to seriously reconsider dipping his toe back into the bloody waters that made him famous. It was Bob that came to me and said, and I've got Drew Barrymore attached. I said, Drew Barrymore wants to be in a horror film? Just, she likes it. Getting Drew Barrymore in Scream was a huge deal. While Drew was obviously famous at the time um, and a star at the time, she had not yet become the megastar that she is now. Despite the attachment of Barrymore, Craven was still not so quick to dismiss his initial concerns. I think it was actually the opening section in the writing, just the, the sort of tormenting of a girl for 15 minutes and then having her killed and disemboweled. And I just said, well, do I want to do this again? What's this going to do to my karma? In the end, it was the words of a young fan that solved the director's moral dilemma. A little kid, um, I think 12 years old, somewhere around there coming up to me and saying, you should do a real movie again because you've been doing, your movies are getting softer and softer. And that just stuck with me and I was, you know, look, you've been fighting this whole career, but the movies you've made that have really been important have crossed the boundaries of decency and are scary because they are ruthless. And I called up Bob Weinstein and said, you know, if that job is still open, I'll take it. We, you know, sat down and over a period of time um, I think he came to see what it could be. Drew Barrymore played a big role in getting Wes to take another look at the project and see what it really was. He said yes, and we were all thrilled, and it took off. When he came on board, we knew. We knew we had something. With a genre-bending script, a Hollywood starlet in the lead, and their first choice director officially on board, the film was finally beginning to take shape. Everything seemed to be going according to plan, until the day Drew Barrymore came up with a radical idea, one that was either uniquely inspired or one that could completely derail the project. The question now became, would Wes Craven's scary movie ever see the light of day? Don't worry, you'll find out soon enough, I promise. In 1995, screenwriting newcomer Kevin Williamson wrote a script that combined teenagers, terror, and humor in a way no one had before, attracting upstart genre studio Dimension Films, and after a few false starts, famed horror director Wes Craven. With the key elements in place behind the camera, Craven's next goal was to cast the movie with stars plucked from the world of film and television, but first, the production had to deal with a major blow. Drew Barrymore, the star who was attached to play the lead role of Sydney, had a last minute and very unexpected change of heart. At about five or six weeks of, till we were to shoot uh, in prep, she changed her mind. What does she want to do? She wants to just be in the opening. I remember Drew actually telling us, the audience will think, because I'm Drew Barrymore, that I'll survive this movie and I get killed in the first, you know, five minutes of the film. We were not happy uh, at all, but, you know, we were on board. And I almost said, okay, that's it, I'm out of here. I think for a minute there, Wes thought about quitting. But he didn't quit. Rather, Craven and his team adjusted to Barrymore's bold new idea. She loved that opening sequence. You never told me your name. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at was such a canny decision. She worked for five days, and she made a niche in cinematic history for, for her genre films in that five days of incredible work. 
And even though Drew Barrymore would no longer be playing the lead, the producers and Wes Craven quickly realized that losing their star didn't mean losing her star power. With Drew being attached, that's really what got the rest of the cast into it. The phones were ringing off the hook. Everybody wanted to be in this movie. So our casting sessions were fantastic. They were great. Those early casting sessions would begin with the search for an actress to fill Barrymore's shoes in the role of the film's heroine, Sidney Prescott, a character that combined intelligence and strength with real vulnerability. It goes back to, you know, the classic Scream Queen. I mean, Sigourney Weaver and Alien, Jamie Lee Curtis and Halloween. There is uh, numerous other actresses that they had screen tested. Alicia Wood came in, Brittany Murphy came in. Reese Witherspoon never actually came in, but her name was certainly in consideration. The role of Sydney would ultimately go to an actress who'd already cast a spell over teen audiences in the 1996 cult favorite, The Craft, and who is currently a staple on a hit weekly television show. And I remember Nev was on Party of Five. You know, that show was really starting to blow up. The camera pans to a desk against the wall where Sydney Prescott, a young girl of 17, sits, her face glued to the computer monitor in front of her. I was at a place in my career was very new. You know, I, I had done Party of Five and, and that had hit in the first year and I'd done the craft. She just had a perfect combination of the innocence that you needed but the strength uh, of, of that girl who was going to be able to <laughs> When we saw Nev Campbell, it, there was no question. So who are you? The question isn't, who am I? The question is, where am I? So, where are you? <sighs> Your front porch. Scream was really the first lead that I'd been up for in a film and was called in and did a big audition. Um, and I think I had several callbacks. That's uh, enough. Sub bucket out of here. <laughs> do you see what you do to me? Do you know what my dad will do to you? You just believed her as this teenage girl, this vulnerable teenage girl. Everyone in the room when we watched it was like, that's Sydney. With the film's lead in place, it was time to round out the rest of the cast, starting with Sydney's boyfriend, the charming yet broodingly mysterious Billy Loomis. The Billy Loomis character, his name even is a tip of the hat to the Halloween movies, which were a big influence on Kevin. Sam Loomis is the character that Donald Pleasance played in the Halloween movies. So we're looking at the part of Billy. It was so hard to find the perfect, you know, handsome guy. There suddenly was this buzz about this kid named Skeet Ulrich. He reminded us, he reminded Wes certainly of when he cast Johnny Depp in Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> Totally nailed it. There was just no question. He was Billy. He was fabulous. He was the hot young guy. And you look back now and his performance is pitch perfect. Sheriff, I didn't kill anybody. And all the girls went crazy. All, that's how you can tell. Every girl is turning red and sweating. Norman Bates have a motive? Nope. And did they really ever explain why Hannibal Lecter liked to eat people? Don't think so. You see, it's scarier when there's no motive, Sid. I knew that he, he was really like a hot new thing in Hollywood. He was the hot ingenue, if I can say that scheme. Next in the casting lineup was Sydney's loyal best friend, Tatum Riley. I had seen Rose McGowan at the Sundance Film Festival that year in a movie called The Doom Generation, and I was just so mesmerized with her. From behind, a finger taps her shoulder. She spins around to see Tatum Riley, same age, feisty, carefree. I think Tatum was very glib, but at the same time, she had a real sweetness, like in the scene in her bedroom. Bam! Sid! Super Rose is so feisty and her character Tatum so feisty. Yeah, I think she was just funny. I mean, I think she was just going for the laugh. Even with other contenders, such as television actresses Rebecca Gayhart and Melinda Clark vying for the role, there was little doubt in the minds of the filmmakers as to who they would cast. We did look a lot of people for that part, um, and in the end there really was just no question because she totally embodied, you know, what Tatum needed to be. Rose manages to be cute and hot at the same time. Finding the right actor for the pivotal role of Stu Mocker, Tatum's beau and Billy's best friend, proved to be a case of a young actor being at the right place at the right time. The day that Matthew Lillard came in, he happened to be across the hall with his girlfriend who was working with another casting director. And I looked at him and I said, um, you look good for this part. Would you mind coming in and auditioning, please? Next to Tatum sits her boyfriend, Stuart, with his arms draped across her back. He's a Billy wannabe. Almost the jock, almost handsome, almost cool. He tries way too hard. <laughs> Stu was with me last night, okay? Yeah, it was. I 
go back and watch that, I'm like, first of all, I weigh 80 pounds. Second of all, I spit my way through the whole thing. And that vein that runs the middle of my forehead is terrifying. I mean, that alone should have just automatically kicked me out of Hollywood in general. Rounding out the lineup of suspects and soon-to-be victims was uber geek and resident horror film fanatic Randy Meeks. He's the Joker, the wild card. And he's the one that you can't quite figure out, and he can comment on everybody because he's slight, just slightly outside the group. Across the table is a fifth wheel Randy, a tall and gangly kid with no such Billy-like aspirations. A witty jokester who elevates geek to coolness. Did you really put her liver in the mailbox? Because I heard that they found her liver in the mailbox next to her spleen and her pancreas. At the time, I was a very struggling actor, and I said, I got to get in for this movie. It was just one of those moments where we'd seen a lot of people for this role, for Randy, and we just didn't know where we were going. And I get a call from my agent. She goes, hey, um, it's not bad. It was between him and Breck and Meyer, but just, you know, it was just that certain something that, that got him the part instead of Breck and Meyer. And three, never, ever, ever, under any circumstances say, uh, I'll be right back. I love Breck and Meyer, but Jamie Kennedy really owned that part. Thank you. With the main team cast now in place, the producers began their search for the right actors to portray the film's adult characters, beginning with Tatum's bumbling older brother, Deputy Dewey Riley. Oh, Dewey. A young officer looks at the clipboard. This is Deputy Riley, better known as Dewey. He's a big guy, 20s, handsome in a scrub clean boyish way. Damn it, Dewey. Well, what did mama tell you? When I wear this badge, you treat me like a man of the law. That's one of my favorite aspects of Dewey, is that he's in a position of power, but no one gives him respect. You know, I always think in, in Dewey's mind, I always think like he thinks he's kind of clean, Clint Eastwood. Like, you know, he thinks he's really cool, but then, you know, nobody else does. The whole David thing was very interesting because he was, we, we offered him a role of one of the kids. I read it and um, I came in and I said, uh, Wes, I, I really would, rather uh, do the role of Dewey. And he was like, Dewey? Well, why would you want to do that role? I was like, well, I do get to kiss Courtney Cox. And <laughs> if I may say so, Miss Weathers, you are much prettier in person. I took a chance on this guy who wants it so much. So Dewey became kind of the heart of the movie. Playing the yin to Dewey's yang was Gail Weathers, a cynical TV journalist and a difficult role to cast until a television star surprised everyone and lobbied hard to get the role. We probably offered the role of Gail to Janine Garofalo and she passed on it. We also were very close to hiring Brooke Shields and then um, we met Courtney. I wanted to play the part of Gail Weathers because she was just a total It was something that I hadn't got to play um, in a while, at least being on Friends for so long. She was the hottest thing coming off of Friends. I mean, for her to be in a movie like this was a very big deal because people were really used to seeing her on the number one show. And I had to really do some persuading to get the part because they didn't really see me as a If I'm right about this, I could save a man's life. Do you know what that could do for my book sales? And working under power-hungry Gail Weathers was her much put upon cameraman, Kenny Jones. Jumping from the driver's seat is Kenny. Gail's cameraman and flunky. An earnest young chap on the chubby side. I was kind of in decent shape before the film, and there's all these fat jokes about Kenny, so I purposefully put on 20 pounds. Kenny? Yeah? I know that you're about 50 pounds overweight, but when I say hurry, please interpret that as move your fat tub of lard now! It was trying to make him likable and, and that the audience has some empathy for him. With the majority of the cast now in place, there was just one more important role to fill, that of the maniacal killer. But this time, it wouldn't really matter what the actor looked like. The killer in Wes Craven's latest movie would be known for something that almost every slasher icon before never had, a voice. And to keep the terror real, that voice belonged to a man the cast, even to this day, has never seen. You hang up on me, you'll die just like your mother. With casting for Wes Craven's new horror film nearly complete, the search was on to fill the final critical role, that of the masked knife-wielding killer. Like many of the murderers from horror movies past, Ghostface would be played on screen by a Hollywood stuntman. 
but the threatening voice of the killer would be brought to life by another unseen actor. Do you want to die, Sydney? Roger Jackson, the perfect voiceover artist. His voice is just creepy and menacing enough. You hear that voice, it still gives you chills. I was hired to play the scene with Drew Barrymore. And the intention at that time was that I was going to play the scenes and they would dub a voice in later. I think Roger brought a real intelligence and, you know, creepiness, probably much more intelligent than we had planned on. It was not only his intelligence and creepiness that won the veteran voice actor the role, but his ability to completely terrify the actors he was playing against. In truth, though Jackson only played the voice of the killer, he actually was on set and on the phone during each take, but kept completely hidden from the actors, which only added to the character's frightening mystique. Well, that's actually an interesting thing. Wes did not let the actors see who was doing the voice. It was always a point to keep us separate because my job is to frighten them during the filming. There is no monster as frightening as the one you create in your own imagination. I think it was really great choice of Wes's to not have any of the actors actually meet Roger uh, because I think it helped us all to stay in character and not be so familiar with him as a person. The question is, But it wasn't just physical proximity to his on-screen victims that made Ghostface menacing. It was his voice, cleverly enhanced by an electronic handheld device that further allowed the killer to disguise his identity. Called Guess How I'm Gonna Die! The voice box was, one, again, one of the smartest, most clever gimmicks, because that, hello, Sydney. It's, it's kind of in Saw, you hear, I wanna play a game. I wanna play a game. The idea that anyone could be the killer but just by putting on the costume and using the voice box was so scary because you didn't know who it was. The next step in the creation of Ghostface was to find the right look to match the menacing voice. A task which seemed simple enough but became a source of creative frustration for the filmmakers and effects artists. The script just says Ghostface. We had no idea what that looks like. Okay, that's a fantastic on the page, but... How do you translate that into something visual? Wes had to shoot the movie, so obviously it came into his mind, what does this guy look like? Even some of the most gifted special effects artists in Hollywood were at a loss to find the right face for the film's iconic killer. I know that uh, they had a lot of people drawing pictures of scary things, you know, witches, goblins, monsters, vampires, and they would send them to Wes. Either Wes liked them or didn't like them. I remember we had our first production meeting, and I took all the sketches with me and showed Wes, and, and he's like, ah, maybe this one, but I don't know. So we had our art department making up masks, and we're getting closer and closer to the time to shoot. Everything that we saw just didn't look good. It wasn't right. It didn't carry any weight. Just none of them, to me, looked like the right mask. Once again, it was being at the right place at the right time that presented Craven with a solution. So we were scouting, and we ended up sh uh, scouting in the house where they shot Shadow of a Doubt. In that house is where I found the ghost face. There was a woman who was older, and her kids were grown up and had moved out. And I went upstairs. It was like her son's bedroom. And the ghost mask was sitting there. So we took the mask and we sent it to Dimension Films. And they said, uh, OK, we like that. So have your guys make one kind of like that, because we don't own it. And he brought it to us and said, this is what I think I want it to be. We sculpted all different versions, like one with longer chin, one with a furrowed brow, one with bigger eye sockets, one with smaller eye sockets, one with broader face. We sculpted and re-sculpted and re-sculpted and re-sculpted. And none of the masks were looking good. You know, they just didn't have what that mask had. And I think I must have seen maybe seven different versions of it before we came to the final, but there's something about the design that is really striking and really shocking when it comes up against you. The thing about it is it just happens to be so archetypal. Many people compare it to Edvard Munch's The Scream. It has a mournful sadness that's almost dreamlike. It was like a love affair with that, with that mask. I mean... And it has struck everybody that sees that mask has been drawn to it. With the look of the mask finally settled upon, the next step was to find a suitable costume for Ghostface. There is no description of what the killer is wearing. 
So take the mask out of your mind and you have a guy. Wes spent a lot of time talking to us about what do we think he's wearing. We went a long way down the road with, a, with white robes, because it was a ghost, supposedly. Does he look like Casper? And obviously, you know, you put a guy in white with a white mask, you don't want to look like he's in the Klan either. So what's he going to look like? So we discussed with the costume designer at the time, and we came up with a black costume. It had a little bit of sheen to it and sparkle so that it would catch the light. It was quickly discovered that the costume also needed to serve a vital plot function. So we came up with the idea of covering the whole body, covering the hands, covering the feet, um, because it also had to kind of be a couple different people. So it actually got down to covering every square inch of the killer with this costume that we devised. The main thing we were worrying about was just, were people going to buy the ghost as anybody? And I think they totally do. There is this kind of supernatural killer in a way. I mean, ghost faced. He can fall out windows almost like Michael Myers and walk away and not a scratch. There's never a bruise on the face from the fights this ghost face gets in. The face, somebody, anybody can put that on, which I think is one of the things that makes the Scream movie scarier, is that it could be anybody. And they're using this, this persona, this you know white, blank, ghost face, emotionless thing as this uh, way to uh, rip you to pieces. Underneath the mask underneath the monster that is out there that horrible ghost face killer is us and i think that is to me the most important thing that we all have to do as human beings is stop externalizing evil and look inside of ourselves i am the darkness that exists in the mind of all people i am not one person i exist across the spectrum of the human psyche and I will find a way to you. With a cast, a killer, and a crew ready to go, everyone looked forward to the first day of shooting in the bucolic Northern California town of Santa Rosa. But actors and crew members who thought the peaceful surroundings meant a trouble-free shoot were in for a major surprise when all hell broke loose over the script and the filmmakers found themselves in the middle of a political firefight. In the spring of 1996, Studio Dimension Films and veteran horror director Wes Craven were ready to bring Kevin Williamson's genre-bending screenplay Scary Movie to life. But first, they needed to find the right location to stand in for the film's pastoral community of Woodsboro, the place where all of the movie's terror would be unleashed. The location of where the film was to be shot was, um, I thought, critical. And we went up to the wine country and Scott did. So back when I was thinking, as a loyal Californian, I have to shoot in California. Miramax wanted to do this movie for $15 million, and they didn't want to do it in California. It was going to be too expensive. And I said, well, we want you to shoot in Vancouver because it's going to save us a million dollars. It's a beautiful place, but it's not American. And then we went to Santa Rosa, and, you know, it's all there. It seemed all, it just fit. You know, the Hillsburg Town Square, the small town atmosphere, the houses. And it was one of those times where I've taken uh, kind of a tough stand. And I remember going to Bob's office in New York and saying, I, um, I think this is very important. And somebody in Bob or Harvey's office said, that's fine, instead of Wes Craven's scary movie. We'll just do Joe Blow's scary movie. Ooh. You know? Okay, there goes a great job. And one of the Weinsteins said, all right, that's, his name is worth $3 million. Go get him and went back up and he said, well, if it's that important, okay, fine. <laughs> no, so it was that close. With the location dispute behind him, Wes Craven began scouting in the picturesque Northern California wine country, finally settling on the beautiful town of Santa Rosa. For Craven and his team, one location in particular caught their attention. There was a beautiful high school in Santa Rosa that they seemed to be very film friendly. Santa Rosa High School had actually been used in film before. It's the high school in Francis Ford Coppola's Peggy Sue Got Married. And that was one of the big selling points about going to Santa Rosa was, well, here we have this high school and it seems perfect. It seems the best for production. I wanted very much that very, very American feel to it. So that's how we ended up there. But the reception the filmmakers received was not as inviting as the location's rolling green hills. Although the high school's administration had initially welcomed the cast and crew, it was the Santa Rosa City School Board that had the final say, and they were less than enthused. The principal and everybody else there was extremely excited about it, so that was totally a positive experience. 
So we went weeks and weeks into pre-production, and then very close to the time we were going to shoot, the school board said, oh, wait a minute, you got to shoot there, let us read the script. When we had our first presentation, we were told that it was a, a spoof, a comedy, and what we read was not. They read the script and uh, were completely affronted by it, just thought it was despicable and uh, should not be allowed in their high school and, and pulled the contract. The board had an opinion at the time. They didn't really want to glorify um, violence against children. And you have to remember, that was a sensitive period of time for Sonoma County. The production's timing coincided with the tragedy of Polly Class, a case that gained national attention. On October 1st, 1993, 12-year-old Polly was kidnapped at knife point from her mother's home during a slumber party. She was later found murdered, having been strangled by her abductor, Richard Allen Davis. And the trial was just starting against uh, uh, Davis, who was the uh, murderer. Uh, this was had a great impact upon uh, the feelings of our community, and there was a lot of raw nerves about it, as I recall. And basically what they did is they had a big town hall, and everyone was allowed to say their piece. And so one citizen after the other would come up and give their opinion as to whether or not we should shoot there. It was a vocal crowd that greeted school district directors tonight, along with not one, but two long lines of people ready to comment on the controversy. The entire scientific community has reached a consensus that violent viewing, viewing is harmful for people. It's harmful for you, most harmful for young people. It's harmful Those for opposed to the movie cited the violence expected to be associated with the horror flick as a reason for banning the film crew from campus. The thing that needs to be understood though is the decision to not allow the uh, Wes Craven production here was not based on people's views of morality or the content of his film. It was based on the disruption of the educational program and then they voted, and they voted us out. In retrospect, I can understand the, the trauma that was on that, that area because of, uh, of that case, but uh, they were very harsh. We were treated like scum. I, I don't, don't draw any judgment upon his work. I think he's a talented and brilliant guy. It's just a game we didn't want to play, and we weren't interested in pursuing it. I did put in the, uh, in the end credits, and no thanks whatsoever <laughs> to the center. Rose the school board. I guess he got his last word in on us, and uh, you know, maybe appropriately so. Craven and his crew ultimately solved their location issue when they were invited to shoot the film's high school sequences at a local community center in the neighboring town of Sonoma. It had been a high school, and it didn't fall into the jurisdiction of any of the school boards, um, so we could pay to use it, and that ended up being the high school. And we put the big sign, Woodboro sign, up over the thing and put some lockers in the hallways. The next location to lock down was to be the home of Tatum and Dewey Riley, which turned out to be near two other homes that had already earned their own film pedigree. Across the street from Tatum's house, uh, Rose McGowan's house, was uh, the Pollyanna house. And then next door, Across the side street is the house that was used in Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt. With its filming locations finally secured, production of Wes Craven's scary movie officially began on April 15th, 1996. Action! The first uh, five days of photography in Scream was the opening Drew Barrymore sequence. The character Casey was, you were so with her, making her jiffy pop and home alone. She's vulnerable. She thinks she's safe because she's in her home. That whole opening with, with Drew was meant to start in a completely innocent way and get heavier and heavier and heavier. And I love the elements that sort of tied it to, you know, when a stranger calls, that creepy guy on the phone. Why haven't you checked the children? It's something of a cultural icon. All you have to say is, We've traced the call. It's coming from inside the house. And everyone would know what you were talking about. But the idea that you could now do that to somebody with a cell phone and that they're wandering around your house looking at you is terrifying. Like the frightening film that inspired it, the terror threatening the young girl was just a phone call away. And voice actor Roger Jackson's job was to provide the menace that would make Drew Barrymore's performance seem very, very real. It's my job to try and scare the hell out of them. A lot of what she did at, at full tilt, uh, screaming, running around on her bare feet, that was all for real. She found it. She brought it. I mean, people thought, well, Drew Barrymore is going to be in the whole film. And it suddenly was this almost a psycho switch. There's 
he just dispenses of her so quickly. I cried when, you know, Drew Barrymore gets stabbed. I thought her performance was magnificent. It was so powerful. And Drew's did such an amazing job with it. I had such a great time working with her that, uh, you know, it turned out to be one of the best things on my reel, so to speak. But despite Wes Craven's confidence, he still had to prove his vision of the film to the studio. I know as those dailyers were coming in, there was concern in part of the studio that it wasn't going to be scary, that it wasn't being um, shot the way they had hoped it would have been going to be shot. I know they were putting all sorts of pressure on Wes and everything like that. And in Hollywood parlance, that means you're about to be fired. There was a lot of things in the beginning that were, that could have made the ship sink. Bob hated the ghost mask. And we shot the entire Drew Barrymore scene with it. I didn't think that uh, the audiences would be scared about it, but it uh, shows you what I know. It's difficult, you know, because you have a lot of cooks in the, in the kitchen. So the filmmakers set out to prove to the studio the opening sequence and the look of the film's ghost-faced killer would indeed work. We immediately cut it as fast as we could and sent 13 minutes of work print to Bob Weinstein and uh, to mention films in New York. I believe their immediate response was, oh my God, we were so wrong, this is brilliant. Whatever you need, everything changed based on that opening 13 minutes. It, it's really a testament to Wes. I mean, having a strong vision, and he really put himself out there. With the first scenes complete, Wes Craven led his cast and crew onward, but nothing could prepare them for what would end up being the longest, most grueling, and bloodiest night in horror movie history. Stop right there! In the spring of 1996, production on Scary Movie was moving forward, despite a bitter fight with the local school board over permission to film in the local high school. In addition, actress Drew Barrymore had opted out of playing the lead role, choosing instead to portray the slasher film's first on-screen victim. While these hurdles were behind them, director Wes Craven and his team faced yet another challenge, shooting the film's climactic and blood-drenched 42-minute finale. Yeah, that was the scene, uh, the scene from hell. It was um, essentially the whole third act. So it began with the party at the house, at Stu's house. And uh, since it didn't change locations, it all was lumped under, you know, scene 118A, B, C, D, up through the alphabet. That just became kind of a joke that we survived scene 118. It was called People Live, People Die. It just kind of seemed endless that we were up at this house and just night after night, that was where, you know, Billy and, and, and Sid made love. That was where uh, Randy gave his rules of horror. That was where Dewey and Gail showed up. And it just went on and on and on. We were at that location forever. Shot over a grueling 21-night schedule, the film's last act would see the end of many of its most memorable characters, beginning with Sidney's loyal best friend, Tatum. It was wet every night, cold, wet. And Rose McGowan, she was, she was cold. And to this day, I get asked if I had some sort of a prosthetic in my chest, which I didn't even know was possible. I had no idea what was going on, but it became very popular with boys. Her breasts were very, very taut. It was cold there when we were shooting. I mean, it was, it was very nipply. I know, good, huh? But McGowan had more pressing concerns, such as her character's impending death scene. And it was really fun killing Rose McGowan, but the only problem is she said she couldn't scream. So that took a lot of work, because she was getting killed in the garage door. They actually had to nail me to the inside of the garage door so I wouldn't fall through. And I had bruises from hanging and like screaming and going up and down and up and down. I did find that I can, in fact, fit through doggy doors. She got through. It was amazing. She got much farther through than we thought she would. Also amazing, at least to the actors in hindsight, was the fact that no one, including Tatum's own brother, Deputy Dewey, seemed to acknowledge poor Tatum's untimely demise. I feel quite badly that Dewey was never sad about Tatum's death. I mean, I obviously should have mourned the death of my sister. What a cold... <laughs> That happened later in the hospital room. What do you mean she's gone? The next to find himself at the mercy of Ghostface was Kenny the cameraman. That was the day my wife first came to visit. And then I remember my neck was cut open. And, oh yeah, by the way, it threw my head back and just my neck gapes open. And it, it, it freaked her completely out uh, that it was that realistic, you know, up close. And while the casualties on screen were gory and dramatic, the unexpected loss of a key behind-the-scenes player was, for some, just as shocking. 
I would like to say that I survived scene 118, but in fact, that was on the last week of shooting, and I was fired. We went to work one day, and Mark wasn't there, and it's kind of funky that they would just let the DP go and nobody says a word. I don't really know totally what happened. I think him and Wes probably had creative differences. Now, I have no idea what the, the, the backstory was with the studio, with Harvey, with Bob, with Wes, but I do know when we saw dailies that night, Wes turned around and said to me, all this footage is out of focus. There were certain issues with focus and things being discussed. Wes and Marianne come from the other room and said, here's what we want you to do. We want you to fire your camera crew, all those people, the dolly grip, and that's what the solution will be. And sometimes the head of the department is, will go, go, go to the lengths of saying, well, if you're going to get rid of them, you're going to get rid of me too. And I said, why don't you get a new DP as well? Problem is, when you say that, you better be prepared for people to take you up on it. And they said, you know what? Good idea. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't know what the problem is. All this footage and all the footage that I shot in the film is still in the movie. Well, that was my last night shooting on screen. With only a few days left of shooting, a new director of photography, Peter Deming, was brought in to finish the picture. Now, Craven and his crew prepared to deliver the film's final revelation, the unmasking of Ghostface and the shocking reveal of the killer's identity. I thought the reveal was, was brilliant. I think it was unexpected for audiences. It's one of those moments where you want to just walk up to the writer and shake his hand and go, you've done something no one thought of before. I mean, I've sat in a full audience of, of that movie and was blown away by hearing people trying to figure out who it was. You know, I, I think when you watch a film like this, it's the whodunit, and, and most often you, you're just trying to figure out who the one person is. The great red herring is that, of course, there's not one killer. There are two. Surprise, Sydney. That's why he can be in all these places at once, because it's two people. Billy! So I thought the twist at the end was very good. Why are you doing this? It's all by the game, Sydney. It's called Guess How I'm Gonna Die! I always thought of it as Captain Hook and Smee in Peter Pan. You know, you have this devilish kind of leader who's charismatic and beautiful and everyone, you know, follows them, but he's got this little sidekick and he'll do anything. They have this sort of dynamic duo quality. Uh, you know, uh, Skeet's character, Billy, is definitely the, the mastermind of the operation. I think, you know, Matthew Lillard's character is probably in love with him and is willing to do anything he's, and he says. I mean, they're maniacal, ruthless killers. I mean, they're pretty terrifying. If you look at the given circumstances, you know, you're hacking people apart, you're hanging people from trees, you're killing them in a garage door. You just couldn't believe the level of insanity. They were truly scary. It was just one intense scene after the other, you know, culminating with Billy, Stu, and Sid in the, in the kitchen, and the guys stabbing each other, and everybody covered, covered in blood. I distinctly have these visions of myself and Nev and Skeet sitting in corners with blood, you know, you're covered in blood. And you start the night, you know, with covered in blood, and you finish the night with the sun coming up covered in blood. I was covered in corn syrup for, for weeks on end, and that just got a bit old and disgusting. Plus it was freezing, so it's like <laughs> sticky, freezing blood. And Wes is, Wes is like, well, one of his main quotes almost on every movie is, more blood! Blood. Don't be stingy. It's always saying more blood. But the bloodiest scene was yet to come with the climactic showdown between Sydney and the two killers as they revealed their murderous motive. Hear yeah, that, Stu? I think she wants a motive. <laughs> Here they start to reveal the motive, which um, there were two camps when I sold the script who felt once one camp felt that there should be no motive. Feel scarier without one. I don't really believe in motive, Sid. I mean, did Norman Bates have a motive? No. Did they ever really decide why Hannibal Lecter liked to eat people? Don't think so. And then another group of people felt that there should be a motive. Your slight mother was my father. And she's the reason my mom moved out and abandoned me. So I took that note, and the end result was both. I think the stuff at the end with Matthew and Skeet is, is, is pretty gratuitous. There's a lot of blood and the fact that they're, you know, stabbing each other. Ah! On a scale one to ten, they're freaks. You know, they're, they're a ten. What was that great line? Movies don't create psychos. Movies make psychos for creative. You know, you were basically setting up that all rules were off.
we know these rules too. We're not going to do them. And if we do them, we're now very, very aware that we're doing them. And I think that was pretty genius of Kevin to turn turn horror on its on itself in a way um, and bring those things up and then include them in, in the film. So the audience, oh, I know what's going to happen. And then they don't know what's going to happen. They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big breasted girl who can't act. She's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. Of course, then when the killer attacks, she does exactly that. I think there's also something fun about audience members sitting and watching someone do something really stupid and going, no, don't do it, don't jump up, don't go up the stairs. And, and um, so I think it was fun for us to actually admit that and then carry it through. Kevin was, was brazen about it. He drew your attention directly to those tropes. Knowing what all the cliches are and standing all of them on their heads. Who's there? I'm calling the police. <laughs> you should never say who's there. Don't you watch scary movies? It's a death wish. They've been around for so long, and characters that started doing the same thing over and over again. Don't go outside. No, it's a weird sound. I have to go outside and get killed, you know? Is anybody out there? Is somebody there? You guys doing something I shouldn't see? Basically, in all the horror movies up until that point, when you say that stuff, you get killed. No genre cliche seems safe from this scary movie, with the film even shattering what may be the most infamous of slasher movie rules. You never make love in a horror film. Don't have sex, that's one of the rules. Like, if you have sex, then you're going to die. Like, the, you, if you want to stay alive, just don't have sex with anybody. The character does a lot of the things that the film claims she shouldn't do and if she's going to survive, and then and then goes ahead and does them and does survive. And the fact that, you know, the moment that Sydney figures out, who, or thinks she's figured out who the killer is, is the moment right after she has sex. Although Sidney Prescott would ultimately prevail over her homicidal tormentors, the film would find time to turn one more horror cliche on its head. Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. Not in my movie. Most horror movies, most movies with a killer, you cannot kill the killer, but the cops always die. My character was supposed to die in the first one. Sidney? We liked David's portrayal of Dewey so much that we brought him back. And we all kind of looked at each other and said, we'd be really stupid if we didn't film a shot of Dewey coming out being alive. And so we did. We stuck it on the last day of shooting there. And I was like, really, wow. And then it's completely changed my life. That decision on the set at that time is just kind of uh, unbelievable. Having survived a grueling 21-night shoot in what many cast and crew dubbed the longest night in horror history, the film finally wrapped on June 8, 1996, much to the delight and relief of Craven, his crew, and especially the cast. I think by the end of it, we were all very relieved to be finished. I think the actors went out and literally put all their wardrobe in a pile and burned it. And we had t-shirts made, I survived scene 118. <laughs> Although the cast was set free and most of the crew had survived scene 118, the director's battles were far from over. When the MPAA, Hollywood's Film Rating Association, weighed in, Craven was blindsided yet again, this time in the form of an NC-17 rating, a feature film's kiss of death. In the summer of 1996, after 40 days of shooting and overcoming location setbacks, last-minute casting changes, and the filming of one of the longest and bloodiest slasher movie finales in recent memory, production wrapped on the genre-bending horror film Scary Movie. But director Wes Craven would find himself embroiled in yet another contentious battle over his film, this time with the ratings board of the Motion Picture Association of America. Screen, out of the gate, no one knew what it was, so they came down on it. When we were going through the MPAA challenges on Scream, which were sort of rampant, I think we had to go back nine times. It's very, very lengthy, very expensive, and the MPAA can say, okay, we're gonna look at it again in two weeks, and you're, you're screwed. The MPAA is always, you know, is always after us. It's always the worst thing in the world for a director to cut anything. Although Craven initially refused to cut anything from his movie, Dimension Films could not afford to gamble on an NC-17 rating. So we had a little bit of a battle with Bob Weinstein because obviously they don't want to put a movie out as an NC-17. Um, so Wes lost that battle. And we ended up making some cuts. It's hard when you don't get your rating to understand why. 
Is it too much blood? Is it too much gore? Well, look, let's, let's speak frankly. I think, you know, genre films, horror films, slasher films are about human beings doing cruel and horrible things to each other. I can remember when Wes had to go back and take some frames out of Kenny's death scene because they said the look on my face was too, too disturbing and it had to be trimmed. And Wes's argument was, it's murder. It should be disturbing. Probably the most gratuitous things in the movie are the, the boyfriend, the gutted boyfriend. Oh, God! And one of the things they objected to was the fact as he sat there, his guts became victim to gravity and shifted and fell. Tatum's death uh, was one of the big MPA challenges. Uh, we, we went back several times on that and how much we could show if we're actually getting crushed in the garage door. <laughs> And they essentially were telling us that the entire scene 118, you know, especially Bill and Stu in the kitchen, was just too bloody and it had to be taken out of the picture. And it, it would have killed the picture. I think I'm dying here, man. There was a shot of Stu, Stu's hand sort of hanging down and blood was dripping off it. And I think the MPA said, okay, that's moving blood. We don't allow moving blood, so cut that short. So we cut that short. But Craven's cuts did not land him any closer to getting the R rating he needed. It went on for weeks, and you're always in a situation where your budget is disappearing. You're at the end of post-production. You've got the thing whole, you're usually in mix, so you've, all the editing is done, and now you're fighting this thing, and they're asking for changes. Every change is every single department has to go back and redo all their tracks. It was back and forth, and Wes was writing letters, and, um, phone calls and what would it take to actually be able to get the rating. And with the film's December release date right around the corner, it seemed as if Craven would need a Christmas miracle. And we were getting nowhere. So what happened is Bob Weinstein made a call to MPAA as the head of the studio. And the next thing I knew, we had an R rating. I think that when we expressed to them, please watch it again, understand the context of how this is happening, that it was, that there was an element of humor in it. And I said, Bob, what did you say to them? And he said, I told them it's a comedy. It's a comedy, it's a satire. Now, obviously, it's a, it's a um, intense situation, but it wasn't worthy of uh, the rating they wanted to give it. And that made all the difference. So uh, every film I'm gonna make from now on, I'm gonna say it's a comedy. <laughs> And indeed, Scary Movie had plenty of comedy. Kevin Williamson's in-jokes and pop culture references set it apart from other horror films being released at the time. I mean, you can only hear that Richard Gere gerbil story so many times before you have to start believing it. And suddenly the audience went nuts because that was this crazy urban legend that everyone had heard. Obviously, it was very politically incorrect. And I said, it's too good a joke, you know? <laughs> it's like life can be cruel, so we kept it in. But Richard Gere wasn't the only famous actor to be shredded in Kevin Williamson's razor-sharp script. So we had the small cameo, and we read a lot of people, and it was just one of those things. Henry Winkler came in and nailed it. You know, when he's threatening the two kids with the scissors and everything like that, you're like, this guy's crazy. You're absolutely right. It is not fair. Fairness would be to rip your insides out. To see Fonzie getting killed in a movie was pretty amazing. Even Wes Craven could not escape being caught up in one of the film's many inside jokes. There's a famous shot of the janitor sweeping the hallway. Would you call me? Huh? Not your friend. And it's just Wes with a Freddy hat and, and sweater on. Somebody asked me, you should do a, like a Hitchcock cameo. I always push it off and say, oh, no, no, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. So said, you have to do it, why don't you be the janitor? So um, the day before I sent down and got um, the whole Freddy costume, which I had squirreled away in, in storage. I felt ridiculous and everything, <laughs> but you know, we put it in there and uh, people seemed to like it. So what, what can I say? With its self-conscious jokes and inside references, Kevin Williamson's title, Scary Movie, seemed to be perfect, but not everyone agreed. I said, you've got the wrong title. And he said, why? And I said, it's a scary, terrifying movie with elements of comedy. The original title of Scream was Scary Movie, so, and we all loved it. And then we heard that um, Bob wanted to call it Scream. We were not happy at all. 
that they change the title. You know, it was a mandate. It was absolutely a mandate from Bob and Harvey. That we changed the title. Michael Jackson had a um, song out, and Harvey's listening to it, and of course the song was Scream. So I called them up, and I said, guys, we've got the title, Scream. And when that came out of his mouth, it was like there was a moment of, of silence. Everyone was like, yes, that's the title of the movie. Um, that was one of the places where Bob prevailed, <laughs> thank God. When you see the Scream movies now, that they ever could have been called something else is amazing. They are Scream. With a completed film, an R rating, and a new title, Wes Craven's Scream was finally ready to be unleashed on moviegoers. But one pressing question remained. Would audiences be willing to line up for a slasher film during what many deem the most wonderful time of the year? On December 20th, 1996, at the height of the holiday movie season, a slasher film that combined horror and dark humor was unleashed on the public. That film was Wes Craven's Scream. What Bob said is, uh, you know, nobody comes out with horror films at, at Christmas. And all of a sudden, <gasps> I felt it would be the perfect programming. I said, what does a teenager go see during Christmas? What do they take Christmas off? Uh, Bob, that's when everybody goes to see family films. He says, exactly. So the horrid audience has nothing to see. So there was the idea to say, great, you know what? Let's go against the grain and let's build the audience um, from there. And uh, lo and behold, he puts it out at Christmas. Everybody was thinking that we're doomed. And Variety, four weeks before we came out, called us DOA. While the film earned $6.4 million in its opening weekend, it was hardly the early Christmas present everybody had been hoping for. I got the numbers in the first weekend, and it was like, okay. I said, that's it. People were writing Wes Craven's Washed Up, which I get about every 10 years. We went to see our movie, and there was nobody in the audience. Do you want to die, Sydney? I thought, oh, you know, we didn't nail it. We didn't get it. It's not going to make a lot of money. Despite early critical pans and a less than spectacular opening, Scream began to show signs of life. There was something special happening. The second week, it made about the same no drop. I can't emphasize what a big deal that is. No drop. Third weekend, up higher than the first weekend. Everybody went, wow. And then, bang, it took off. While audiences were shocked and delighted by the film, so too were the cast and filmmakers by Scream's rise to success. It was like word of mouth. Once that happened, I was like, uh-oh. We're on to something. It was the picture that just would not quit. It was just like, wow, this movie is really the little scary movie engine that could. And then it just kept going and going and going until it made, you know, $5 billion or whatever. The film eventually brought in a final tally of $103 million in the United States, staying in theaters an astounding 31 weeks. The movie held the record for a long time as the highest grossing horror movie of all time. The movie made over $100 million and, and cost 16, so it's pretty good math. Scream, a film that reinvigorated the horror genre, not only broke box office records, it even won best film at the 1997 MTV Movie Awards. Clearly, the film was connecting with its audience in a powerful way. You know, it was something you'd never seen before, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why the movie did so well at the time. I knew it was going to be a really good movie as soon as he buried that knife into her chest. This one hit the right time, the right place, with the right cast. Scream certainly will be seen as the iconic horror movie of the 90s. And I think, like, sometimes that just happens with certain movies. You, you run into a moment where things come together at the perfect time, and you got a great director, amazing writer, great crew and, and cast. And uh, then you kind of capture lightning in a bottle. While the on-screen chemistry of the cast was undeniably part of audience's love affair with Scream, the off-camera experience was having the same effect on two of its co-stars. I'm sorry. I'm on duty. <laughs> Wes had sort of like a, you know, a get-together. I immediately went up to her and started flirting with her. Courtney, uh, I'm David. I'm playing doing. She goes, yeah, I've heard about you. I said, like, oh, really? I've heard about you, too. I think uh, Courtney initially was like, yeah, he's cute, but um, this guy's nuts, <laughs> you know? I'm like, she's a good actress, because I really believe that her character is falling for him. It was immediately we were off to the sort of flirtation races. And while life was looking bright for the cast and crew of Scream, 
It also left the door wide open for other studios and filmmakers to cash in on the horror movie's sudden success. The Scream movies were truly an adrenaline shot to the heart of horror. The horror genre just came back, you know, it came back very powerfully. There's been a slew of horror films that have come out after Scream. The studio sort of jumped on the bandwagon and started to make a lot of films and realized that audiences were really looking for that. I think Scream was definitely the catalyst for all these other movies, you know, like Valentine or I Know What You Did Last Summer. Urban Legend was another one. There was a bunch of them coming out. Scream became so heavily imitated. It almost became a parody to have kids referencing other movies. You know the part in scary movies where somebody does something really stupid and everybody hates them for it? This is it. You know, that's the curse of when you do something new and original. But the top spot of all horror slasher films still belonged to Scream. And Ghostface would go on to terrorize Sydney and her friends twice more in Scream 2 and Scream 3, both of which turned the conventions of horror sequels on their head. Cause let's face it, baby, these days, you gotta have a sequel. When um, I read the original script of Scream, he already had the sequel mapped out. In the end of the script was a five-page treatment for the next Scream. He knew where he was going. So we got to follow Sydney, you know, obviously from high school and then on into college and then into young adulthood. So that was uh, almost unprecedented, I think, for, uh, for films in the genre. And uh, really, uh, one of the things that kept me with it. It's been the same cast throughout. And also, we've had a lot of the same crew throughout, which is wonderful, because it, it, it feels like going back to summer camp every time we do it. It's a really fun experience. Seeing that the core cast comes back each time with Wes, um, it's not Scream without that. The sequels are fun, and I enjoy them. But that first one was truly, purely terrifying. You know, rather than thinking I was doing sequels, I was doing, you know, elements of a trilogy, which I, I just loved. It was that enduring love for the Scream franchise that brought about the return of Craven, Williamson, Campbell, Arquette, and Cox for another round of mayhem ten years after the events of Scream 3. Get out! Get out behind you! Scream 4 was really interesting. You know, the, the new cast kind of felt like the old cast. They all hit it off, and there, there was a definite camaraderie there feels reminiscent of Scream 1. I think all of us thought it might just be a real kick to go back to it. Um, I was apprehensive at first, and I really wanted to know that Kevin would come up with a great concept. Make the remake of the groundbreaking. Oh, he takes his chainsaw down to the dead. He kills him. He's an Amityville horror. Like Christmas house of wax. Mom, I'm playing Bloody Valentine. It's one of those, right? None of the ever. By following some rules of the genre, but daring to break others, Scream has made audiences laugh, cheer, and of course, scream. And in the process, it changed the face of fear. If you want to be on a roller coaster ride, you want to go into a dark theater, have the lights turn out, and just there's something about being scared out of your wits that has always appealed to me, and I think it appeals to everybody. I would say there's three important people that are sort of the tent poles of, of Scream. One is Kevin, who came up with the idea and wrote this fantastic script. One is Bob Weinstein, who was willing to go in and put a lot of money on the line. And the other, I guess, would be me. The three of us working together um, is a pretty powerful package. And I'm very proud that uh, Wes is there for all of them. Here he's done one, two, three, and four, and hopefully he'll do them all. And uh, I, I like keeping that continuity. The stars aligned to bring us all together to make something that, I don't know, really made cinematic history. It really kind of got to me and even seeing it you know I scream and laugh and and it's just really witty you know it's just it just really works in so many ways I remember being there and they're like it's going to change your life and this is unbelievable and huge and you know this is gonna put you on the map and I went to this little like place to eat and some girl goes you look like that guy from the from scream the, the rule guy and I was like really sick like, yeah I was like, it was like the first time in my life I was ever recognized. It will always have a special place in my heart. And the fans, they made it. They made it what it is. And I treasure the filming of Scream as my happiest filming experience. Scream's meant well, everything to me, really. I mean, I'm so thankful for Wes for casting me and, and for Kevin for writing such amazing script. It's been a blessing and, and it's been a fun movie to be a part of.
but especially I met my wife on it and you know I have a daughter now because of this and you know it's pretty much doesn't get any better than that. I love this kind of movie. Um, never imagined myself ever being in a movie that, that <laughs> was like this and um, just do something different and work with Wes Craven. There couldn't be anything better than doing a Wes Craven movie. So it was a fantastic ride and it's been one ever since. I think Kevin Williamson wrote a brilliant script from the beginning. We managed to pull off its brilliance. I think audiences love them. I think um, they're highly entertaining. They were great successes. They did great things for all of our careers. They were really fun to make. Um, yeah, and I'm really grateful to have had them in my life. It was my first film, and I got to work with, you know, one of my idols, Wes Craven, who actually, you know, has become a good friend, and it's just been, it's been like a love experience for me. I couldn't have asked for a better first foray into movie making. As a director, um, you know, it's my, my most successful film by, by far, and it has kept me in touch with a very young audience, a very smart audience, and I'll keep making them as long as it's fun. Thank you all, and love you all. Like fish.